Good morning. Please stand with us. Let's begin our worship by singing together. together now from 1 John chapter 3 verses 1 through 3. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that we did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. 1 John 3, 1 through 3.
What a joy it is to gather in the Lord's name, to exalt his name and worship him, proclaim his truth and share fellowship together. And indeed, that's what we're doing in this hour. And uh, I'm going to invite you to remain standing and say hello to folks who are nearby where you are. Let's do that now. And what a privilege it is for me to welcome those of you who are joining us by radio this morning. Thank you for being a part of our service from Caldwell First Baptist Church. This morning we're continuing our study in the life and ministry of John the Baptist. So have your Bible open to the New Testament. We'll be looking at several gospel passages. We're so thankful you joined us and our prayer is that God will encourage you in your walk with Christ as we worship him together this morning. You may be seated. <clears throat> I'm going to have a conversation with four women this morning, four beautiful women, if they'll come up please at this time and take, take a seat here on, this, uh, on these prepared uh, stools. And as soon as they all get in place, I'll introduce who they, who they are, though you know most of them, maybe you know all of them, I don't know. But uh, grab a microphone, ladies, and uh, get yourself perched up there. <laughs> I don't know if I can <laughs> This is not easy. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I kind of hinted at this last week, but I, I, some stories are so wonderful that they must be told. And this is one of those stories. And I want to introduce each of them. Uh, you know Alice. Binford down here on your left. Uh, Alice, of course, is our, is our office manager in the church. And then Alfreda Brown is uh, actually Charlene's sister-in-law. Alfreda's husband, Don, is pastor at the Caldwell Friends Church, just right over here in the neighborhood. And uh, Margaret Hemry is next. Margaret is a manicurist who has her business here in Caldwell. And then Charlene Brown, who uh, most recently was uh, working as an admissions director for a college in Montana. Before that, of course, was at the College of Idaho. And there's a story that brings all these women together, and I want you to hear it this morning. So, Charlene, I'm going to begin with you. How did you actually meet Margaret, and what was your relationship with her? Um, well, uh, some people say I'm a high-maintenance kind of woman, so... <laughs> all in favor? <laughs> Everybody was... Uh, so I, um, uh, a long, long time ago, we were talking about it this morning, how many years? At least 10 years ago, maybe more than that. Um, I was working at the College of Idaho, and the person that was my supervisor always had the loveliest nails, and I just admired him so much, and I said, where do you go to get your nails done? She goes, oh, well, I go to Margaret Henry. Well, then this lady resigned and left, and I moved up in position. I thought, boy, I better get my nails done, you know, so... <laughs> So I, that's how I got to know Margaret. I went, made an appointment, and she did a beautiful job. <laughs> okay. Alice, how, how did you get to know Margaret? Same way. I need my <laughs> nails done. And the lady who normally did them, she moved away, and, and they said, well, Margaret does it. So I made an appointment, went to Margaret, and 
After you get acquainted with Margaret, you'll understand why I say, I just fell in love with Margaret. She was so wonderful. And then as I kept going to her, I found out we had a lot of things in common. Like I knew her husband, Dave. He used to be the Honda uh, office manager when I took my Honda in all the time. And such a nice guy. And then I found out that she knew my cousins. I mean, I knew her cousins from when um, I lived in Napa. They lived across the way. So, so that was really exciting. And that's how I knew her. <laughs> uh, Alfreda, how about you? Uh, did you get acquainted because of Charlene, or how did that work? Well, partly because of Charlene. Uh, I needed my nails done as well. <laughs> and so This seems to be a common yes. problem. With yes. But um, we actually go back farther than that. Our grandson, when he was a little boy, was ring bearer in their wedding. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, so Charlene, as you started going in to see Margaret, uh, did you sense a desire to share your faith with her, and how did that work out? Um, well, um, I well, you have the gift of evangelism, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. No, I don't. I, I have a gift of being friendly. <laughs> <laughs> That's important. Um, I... I um, I just, uh, in the normal course of conversation, uh, we talk about all sorts of things. We talk about our families, and you know, when you go to um, a manicurist and you're there every other week for 10 years, you really get to an know each other. Time. An hour of time, yeah. Um, and so, we talk about our family and our situations and our problems in life and all sorts of things, and just in a matter of course of conversation, um, I might say something like, well, I'm sure glad the Lord's taking care of that uh, for us. Or, wow, I'm, you know, if I didn't have the Lord, I don't know what I'd do. Um, those kinds of things. And, and she, I think, was like, oh, would she just stop? <laughs> well, let's, now, Margaret, how did, how did you feel about that when she would say those things or leave you some kind of literature to read? She, she would. She would come in a lot of times and bring me, you know, scriptures or pamphlets. And at first I was like, oh. Give her a little more gain there, John, can you? Go ahead. I would, I would think, oh, here she comes again, bringing <laughs> more and more stuff. When am I going to have time to read this or listen to this CD? And then when she wouldn't come with something, I think, oh, she didn't even bring me anything. What if this was the time <laughs> I was going to actually read it? <laughs> so she couldn't win. But I, I really enjoyed, though, when she would come in and talk to me about things because I started to hear little bits and pieces. And... She moved away, and guess who started? <laughs> so, 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 Afrida, how did you start talking about faith issues with Margaret? Well, this is kind of a scary thing, because when Charlene left, she said, now, now you have an obligation with Margaret <laughs> in her spiritual I life. That. And, I, and then I'm thinking, oh my goodness, now not only is she doing my nails, but I have an obligation here. And I'm like Charlene, it's, I'm, I think I'm friendly, and it's easy for me to share what I think, but I kind of had heads up there a little bit, so I tried to take over where Charlene left off. And she did. <laughs> it was great. It was like I, I, I left for Montana going, the baton has been passed. <laughs> Alfreda's going to Alfreda's gonna be talking to Margaret. I know this is going to be great. And now, being a pastor's wife, she would bring in even more stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so, so here's the interesting thing. Alice, did you know that Alfreda and Charlene were, were doing this with Margaret? Didn't know it at all. Okay, so what, what were you doing? Well, I just get my nails done and <laughs> go on and see Margaret and just really enjoying her and what I noticed about her is she has a really tender spirit and I would just share my life and she would share where she was at and I didn't think I said all that much to tell you the truth um, but as she shares concerns I would pray for her and uh, there are a few times that I would say well let's just pray right now so I would pray for her right then and and I do remember um, one particular time her husband was was under a lot of stress at his work and so I said oh that is awful let's just pray for him and so I prayed for him and um, I think things are better now but <laughs> anyway that was like several years ago and so that would be I felt like that was my role was just to pray for her I don't think I said too much otherwise 
Meanwhile, meanwhile, the Lord is, is working in, in Margaret's heart. So Margaret, I'd like you to just kind of share what was happening and what happened to you. Well, I, I grew up in a non-Christian home and uh, my parents divorced when I was about 13. And it was a really hard time. Um, I knew I was gonna do this. <laughs> Um, my dad married a lady right after they divorced, and she had two small kids, and then there was another one on the way. And so I went from taking care of, or playing with babies, dolls, to taking care of babies. And um, I did that all the way through until I graduated from high school. My stepmom was a very strong individual um, with negative influences, and uh, my sister and I did a lot of things that normal kids wouldn't do. She uh, encouraged us to steal from our mom, the things that my dad had given her over the years of their marriage. Um, she was also a nurse and had a uh, drug addiction to prescription drugs. And so we were under this really strong influence to do negative things. And at that age, you just kind of do what you're told to do. Otherwise, the consequences are a lot worse. So. Um, I was estranged from my mom until after I graduated from high school, and then I reconnected with her. However, um, I met my husband, and in 97 we got married, we have two boys, and all through my life I always felt like I was carrying all this extra baggage, and just unhappy, like I was missing something more. And, um, I look at my notes here, <laughs> and that's when I met Charlene. <laughs> and, between these three women and it got to the point where I had so many ladies coming in and that's all they would talk about was the Lord mm. and I kept thinking what is up with these people <laughs> <laughs> you know and I would get bits and pieces from each one of them every time they'd come in but it was nine hours out of ten hours of my day that people would talk to me about the Lord and I thought maybe I need to start listening <laughs> so in the meantime my husband starts listening to the Bible on CD on his way to work, and so he'd come home and talk about that. And my little boy, he was I think five at the time, was asking questions about the Lord that I didn't know how to answer. And so I just started thinking, maybe, maybe there's more to this. And so I went to a couple of funerals, and I got a lot of messages from each one of them. One in particular was this little man, he was in his late 90s when he died, and he was, um, he loved the Lord a lot, and he would always pray with me every time I'd see him and tell me, you've been saved, you've accepted the Lord, but I never felt different, and I didn't act differently either. And so I thought, well, if that's accepting the Lord, I don't know, you know, nothing's changed really. So at his funeral, the pastor said, good people don't always go to heaven. You have to have more than just being a good person. And I always thought of myself as a good person, but I thought, that really, it really hit me. And so, after that funeral, um, a classmate of mine had died, just dropped out of a heart attack at 40 years old. And he also had had a really rough life. And so I came to my husband and I said, you know, I wonder what happened to Sean. I wonder where he's spending eternity, not knowing for myself. I mean, I knew there was a God, but I didn't have that connection. And I remember talking to my husband and he said, well, when you die, you just go on the ground and that's it. And that made me mad, even though I didn't know more about it, it just bothered me. And at that point, I felt like my life was kind of in a downhill spiral. And I was still getting <laughs> messages all the time. And so I was, you know, wanting more, but not sure how to get it. So on January 3rd, 2011, I made this appointment with this pastor that, that did the church service for the, uh, my classmate that died. And I went in and I was going to talk to him about my husband not knowing the Lord. You know, why he thought that you just, when you die, you go on the ground. So I meet with him and we talk. And first I was going to cancel the appointment. I thought, I'm not going to waste his time. He doesn't want to deal with me, you know. I kind of had a chip on my shoulder. And, but I couldn't cancel the appointment. So I go in and he asked me, you know, what can I help you with? And I said, oh, my husband... You know, just thinks that when you die, you go on the ground, and that's it. And he asked me a lot of questions about myself, and he looked at me, and he says, Margaret, you're not here for your husband. 
And I thought, how dare you say that? Of course I am. Why else would I be here? He said, you're here for yourself. And instantly, this weight was lifted off my shoulder. And I said, I think you're right. I am here for myself. So we continued to talk. And he asked me more questions. And after an hour, he says, if you'd like, I would like to pray with you so you can accept the Lord. And I said, I've had that happen so many times. It's never, you know, I don't feel any different. But, you know, if you want to, go ahead. So the pastor prayed with me. And we were almost finished, and, and I remember thinking, okay, this time I'm going to take in every word he says. And as he prayed with me, I remember feeling this explosion in my chest. It felt like my heart was being ripped out. It was the most amazing feeling I'd ever felt next to childbirth. <laughs> <laughs> C-section, so I didn't have the pain, <laughs> the flavor. <laughs> but I remember thinking, when you guys would come in, I wanted what you guys had. I didn't know what you had, but I wanted more. And when he prayed with me, and my chest felt like it was just my heart was being torn out, and I was shaking more so than I am now. <laughs> and he told me, he says, he asked me, he says, are you okay? And I said, I don't know what happened. And he smiled, and he says, you just accepted the Lord, and the angels are rejoicing. And it's true. And I was on a high for like eight months, I think, <laughs> after that. And I remember leaving thinking, I'm always, I'm always the kind of person that makes a decision and regrets it. And I remember that day leaving his office and thinking, I wonder when this feeling is going to go away. When am I going to regret that I accepted the Lord? And I went home that night, and I talked to my husband, and I said, okay, here's what I've done. <laughs> and I said, I don't know what it means. I don't know what to do. But I said, I like how it feels, and I, I want to move forward. And he says, I'll take the journey with you. Don't expect a lot from me, but I'll take the journey with you. <laughs> and so I remember going back to work, and I could not wait to tell these ladies and all the other ones that had a big part in it. For me. So over the next six weeks, sharing these stories every hour for nine, ten hours a day, I was pretty exhausted because it was such a high, you know, and then it was so emotional. Um, but these ladies played a big part in it for me, and they, and they didn't realize how much they played. And I finally have read some of the literature you gave me. <laughs> The thing that's so interesting about this is how the Lord worked it out. But bottom line is, nothing happens spiritually in terms of a new birth until what's in my head connects with my heart. And when what's in my head connects with, with what's in my heart, then birth occurs. And as I said last week, every one of us has a different experience. But all of us have the same experience in knowing that when Jesus comes in, life has changed. Life is different. Not just for a moment, but for eternity. And uh, some people, as I mentioned last week, kind of come into the kingdom dragging their feet. Some people come in laughing. Some people come in crying. Uh, the, the birth experience is different for all of us. But for every person, the invitation is, come to Jesus. Put your faith and trust in Jesus. Believe that Jesus died for your sins and rose bodily from the grave and is seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven right now, interceding for those who have trusted in him. Margaret, we're so glad you're part of the family. Thank you all very much. Thank you. I appreciate the courage this took for Margaret to come and, and uh, share in front of strangers, but I assured her that it you would be a very supportive and loving audience, and, and indeed you, you are. Our missionaries of the week this week are Rob and Jody Herman, the Herman's minister in Indonesia. And uh, if you want to read a gripping uh, missionary letter, get a copy of Rob's letter. It's in the, it's in the lobby. 
As you read that, you will be on the edge of your seat as he was hauled in uh, by the Indonesian police in a region where he was visiting. You remember that uh, Indonesia is the largest Muslim country in the world. And Rob and Jody have been called there by the Lord to minister. And uh, so someone is going to get the chance to read the letter because it's right here with this addressed and stamped envelope. If you'd like to write the Hermans a note. Okay, uh, there's a hand right there in the back, if you wouldn't mind. And our other missionary of the week is a local ministry, a church link, formerly Mission Media. Troy Hooper is the director. And uh, I know Troy would appreciate a note from you saying, um, we're praying for you at Caldwell First Baptist. And a few months ago, Troy got one of your letters and he said to me when I saw him, hey, that was really special to get a note from, from the church and uh, know that you're praying for our ministry. So here's a chance for you to pray for Troy and uh, just lift your hand, someone. Thank you very much. Let's review our verse of the month together. It's uh, from Psalm 119, verse 18. We'll say the reference, and then the verse, and then the reference together. Ready, begin. Psalm 119, 18. Open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. Psalm 119, 18. I'm going to ask the ushers if they'll come forward at this time. And also, I'm going to ask Carol Brenton if she'll come uh, up on the platform, please. Carol, would you please come? Uh, we just want to have a final word from you before you take off on Tuesday morning. And so, and then we want to pray for you specifically this morning. So, just give us one last update. Just, just, just a moment. <laughs> you don't have 10 minutes. <laughs> Good morning. Um, yeah, I'm uh, fly away on Tuesday, um, heading toward Kenya. I'll be in Kenya for four months. During that time, while I'm in Kenya, I have two tasks. My first task is to learn Kenyan Sign Language. Kenyan Sign Language is kind of the lingua franca of the East Africa Deaf Group. And uh, the second task is um, to learn how to live cross-culturally without offending everybody. And so um, I'm very excited about it. I'm also a little nervous. and. Um, coming here, I have just all sorts of butterflies in my stomach because I know this is my last Sunday here for a very, very long time, and I'm going to miss you all uh, very, very much. Would you pray with me, please? Father, we thank you for the privilege of coming into your presence corporately together this morning, and uh, it's our privilege and honor to pray for Carol as she leaves and begins this uh, adventure for which she has prepared and prayed for several years. Lord, I pray that uh, as she approaches language learning that you would open her mind to grasp concepts quickly. We pray for her safety, of course. In her absence, we pray for her children and grandchildren that they will thrive not only physically but spiritually as they grow in grace and in the knowledge of Christ. Lord, we enjoin her burden for the deaf church, locally and internationally. We pray that the deaf indeed will hear the words of the book. And we pray that as she uh, begins this adventure of ministry with Wycliffe, that she will be a blessing, she will be useful to the work. We also thank you for the ministry of the Hermans in Indonesia today, and pray for their safety and for the effectiveness of their work, as well as uh, for Troy Hooper and uh, ChurchLink. Thank you for the blessing that Sandy Allen has been in our body, and we pray for her as she grieves the death of her sister this past week as she was promoted to heaven. We also intercede this morning for Rick Rhodes as he's facing surgery this week, and we continue to pray for Diane and Karen in their physical needs. Thank you, Father, for other churches in our community that are upholding the gospel. We pray for Oregon Trail Church of God and in Caldwell here, and for Grace Baptist and Emmett, may these congregations be faithful in extending the light of your truth. As we give this morning, we thank you for your faithfulness and goodness to us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Good morning and welcome to worship. Please register your attendance on the tan tablets as they are passed from the outside aisle in and leave the slip on the pew. I would like to give a special welcome to all first time guests this morning. Please stop by the welcome center in the lobby for a complimentary mug. Thank you to all who have shown an interest in providing items for our VBS program. After the service today, there will be a table in the foyer where you can sign up for specific donation needs. Today is Carol Brenton's last Sunday with us, and there will be a cookie reception for her in the library following the morning service today. There is a new women's Bible study on Saturday mornings at 9.30. We have changed the topic from Esther to Deborah, who was uh, the only woman prophet and judge. Please sign up in the Welcome Center. The quarterly business meeting is next Sunday. Next Sunday, at the Malheur County Fairgrounds in Ontario, there will be a Born Wild, Created to be Free, Wild Horse Breaking Gospel Presentation. A country Christian concert starts at 2, and the Illustrated Horse Breaking Presentation begins at 3. That was a mouthful. If you didn't get all the information, there are posters in the lobby. We encourage you to consider designating a gift for Deborah Brown's ministry and Elders Fund gift for Rick Rhodes and Anna Obey. The National Day of Prayer is May 2nd. Ray Harrell is organizing Bible reading in front of the Canyon County Courthouse. Please sign up with Ray. His phone number and other information is in the bulletin. And I would like to wish my dad, Hiram Heiger, a happy birthday tomorrow. He was born in 1928. You can do the math. <laughs> Love you, Dad. And now children ages four through second grade are dismissed.
worship your holy name. I was 21 years old. I was living in a Muslim country, lived there for 15 months. I saw intense devotion and faith. I had uh, been baptized into the Christian faith before I was 10 years of age. I was raised in a Christian home, but I was thrust into a whole different worldview circumstance. And I asked myself, this uh, Christianity thing, is this the real deal? It wasn't that my mind was filled with doubt, although I had some questions about the reliability of the first chapters of Genesis. Thankfully, those questions were cleared up, and I embraced the creation account, and I personally embrace the view of a young earth. That seems the most reasonable understanding of the chapters in Genesis. But at that particular time in my life, I forced myself to answer the question, is Jesus Christ who the Bible claims he is? And I've come to the conclusion that for every person who receives Christ as a child, there comes that time as an adult when childhood faith needs to connect up with adult understanding. Our statistics are better than the national average, but they are still grievous. The number of people who move through our families and our youth group and graduate from high school and go on and, at least for a time, walk away from faith. This is something we talk about at a staff level and at an elder board level, it's something that concerns us. Families talk about it, and we are asking for answers to hard questions. But for every one of you young people who are seated here this morning, as you continue to grow in your physical life and in your emotional maturity and in your spiritual development, you're going to be asking yourself those questions. Is Jesus Christ the Savior? Is he my Savior? Can I take this to the bank? Can I trust him with my life? And I believe, actually, that every believer at some point has a circumstance or experience in their lives that brings them to that question. Is this the real deal? In this morning's study, in the life of John the Baptist and his ministry, we're going to discover a significant and very important key idea about how to move through that process successfully without losing the confidence of your faith. So I'd like you to come with me. We're going to look at several New Testament passages. We're actually going to begin in Luke chapter 3. John's life and ministry is scattered throughout the Gospels, so we need to piece together several passages to get a picture of this particular part of his life. And we're beginning in Luke chapter three in verse 18. This is a transition from ministry to imprisonment, all right? So that's why it's important for us to read these verses. Luke chapter three, verse 18. Let's jump into the text. So with many other exhortations, now we're picking up the context obviously, the context is talking about John's ministry, his strong preaching, 
and exhorting people to repent, with many other exhortations, he preached good news to the people. So John's continuing his ministry. Then we have a very compressed record here of what happened. But Herod, the Tetrarch, who had been reproved by him for Herodias, his brother's wife, we'll get some more details on that, and for all the other evil things that Herod had done, added this to them all. So we're adding to Herod's sins in this account that he locked up John in prison. Now let's get a little more detail about that from Mark chapter 6. Turn back one gospel to Mark's gospel, chapter 6, beginning in verse 17. Mark 6, 17. For it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. In other words, Herod seduced Herodias away from his brother Philip and began this adulterous marriage. For John, verse 18, for John had been saying to Herod, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. He's sticking his nose into Herod's business. Interesting. And Herodias, not surprisingly, had a grudge against him, against John, and wanted to put him to death, wanted to kill him. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. Aren't these details interesting about John's life? So here's the first point I want to make about John's own struggle with doubt. John's faithfulness actually resulted in personal misery. We know that his lifestyle was in sharp contrast to Christ's. In, in Mark 2.18, we read, John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, and people came to him and said, why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples don't fast? So John is encouraging his followers to fast, and Jesus is not emphasizing that in his ministry. So John and his followers are going through this deprivation, and people wonder, why? Why is John's style so different than the style of Jesus? Devout Jews saw fasting as a ready means to turn aside threatening calamities of drought and plague and danger. Mondays and Thursdays were the standard fast days in Jewish tradition because tradition taught that it was Moses who went up onto the mountain on uh, Thursday to get the second version of the Ten Commandments after he had broken the first tablets and that he came back down on Monday. And Jesus wasn't encouraging his disciples to continue this tradition. By the way, there were a whole contingent of followers of John that continued to follow him even after his death. And then in Luke 7, 33 and 34, which we'll look at in detail next week, Jesus said, for John the Baptist has come eating no bread and drinking no wine, and you say, he's demonized. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking. You say, look at him. He's a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But from that one statement of Jesus, we get a clear picture that the lifestyles of these two men and their followers were significantly different. The other thing we noticed about John's ministry is that he is preaching the gospel and he's preaching it powerfully, significantly. And interesting, as we saw, he confronted public sin shamelessly. I'm thankful that there are people who speak into the lives of our national leaders and confront them about their sin. It's kind of under our radar, and I know that many people are frustrated by the lives and lifestyles of some of our public officials, but I also know that there are people who are speaking into their lives as well they should, based out of their relationship with them. And then we just read that Herod arrested him and imprisoned him in the Macarus Fortress. 
The location is outside of the Bible, but we know from the Jewish historian Josephus, who wrote in the first century, that the Macarus Fortress was 15 miles southwest, southeast of the mouth of the Jordan River, where it flowed into the Dead Sea. It was out in the wild and desolate hills that overlooked the Dead Sea on the eastern side, originally built by the Hasmonean King Alexander in about 90 BC, destroyed by Pompey's general Gabinius in 57 BC, but later rebuilt by Herod the Great. And when he died, this fortress passed on to Herod Antipas, who arrested John the Baptist. There was an impressive palace on the hill opposite the fortress. There are scattered remains of this fortress visible even today when you visit that region. What, what did we read about this? Herod was in awe of John because he was righteous. You know, he imprisoned him, but he was in awe of him. And it's interesting also, we read that he, Herod protected John from his adulterous wife, Herodias. And Herod was attracted to John's preaching, even though it pointed out his guilt. He couldn't help himself. He was, he was um, drawn to it. Every time he heard John, he was somewhat perplexed, but he couldn't help himself in being interested. He knew better. You know, uh, we either change our behavior or we change our theology. And Herod was on the fence trying to live both ways. Well, let's go now back to the Gospel of Luke to pick up uh, the rest of the story. We, we've got John in prison, but Luke chapter 7 picks up the details and come with me to verse 18 of Luke chapter 7. Now again, we're jumping into the context. If you look at the early part of this chapter, Jesus heals the servant of a Roman centurion, and then he disrupts a funeral by stopping the funeral procession and raising the son of a widow who has died. And uh, that was a memorable event for everybody. And some of John's disciples saw these things happen. And so they took these stories back to John the Baptist in prison. And we're going to come to verse 18. The disciples of John reported all these things to him. So the point is that in John's, in John's absence, he's stuck in prison. And in his absence, the ministry of Jesus continues. And John hears about the crowds clamoring after Jesus and the mixed response of the people toward his ministry. Obviously, not everyone responded to Christ, but he gathered a crowd. There were, at times, thousands of people trailing after Jesus. Now, it's curious that there's no record in the scripture that Jesus ever visited John in prison. In fact, the scriptures would, by implication, suggest that he did not, that he never did. Jesus never went there. And it's not that John questioned his commission, but, but he needed fresh confirmation. He's stuck there. And Jesus is continuing his ministry. And John knew instinctively that he would diminish and Christ would, would increase. We saw that last week. He knew that instinctively. But there's something about the way these details worked out that began to gnaw away at John. Was it his disciples that needed assurance? I don't know. What, was he growing impatient? How long am I going to have to sit here and languish in this place? I could be a blessing somewhere. Was that it? Maybe he was having a midlife crisis. Is this all there is? I thought there would be more. I knew I was going to hand off to Jesus, but I didn't realize I was, I was going to be stuck on the bench. Worse, I didn't know I was going to be sent to the locker room. Or was he just simply puzzled? I don't know. The scripture does not specify. 
But here's what it does specify. Chapter 7, again of Luke, verse 19. And John, calling two of his disciples to him, sent them to the Lord, saying, Are are you the one who was to come? Or shall we look for another? And when the men had come to him, to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you, saying, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? In that hour, so in other words, they they walk in right in the middle of what Jesus is doing. In that hour, he healed many people of diseases and plagues and evil spirits, and on many who were blind, he bestowed sight. And he answered them, so he finishes his ministry, and then he answers them. Go and tell John what you've seen and heard. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk. Lepers are cleansed. And the deaf hear. The dead are raised up. The poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. So the question is, is it you? Are you the one we're looking for? Or is there somebody else? So deep in the dungeon of the Makaris Fortress sits a lonely man. The kingdom he had preached, for which he had longed and prayed and toiled, the kingdom for which he had endured deprivation. Did he, did he miss something? Months had passed. Some of his disciples had broken ranks and were following Jesus, which was fine. But but what's next? Am I going to get out of this place? Was Jesus going to make any effort on my behalf? Had I somehow misled my followers? Did Did I make a terrible mistake? I don't know exactly what's going through John's mind. Any and all of those things are possible. But it led him to dispatch two of his followers and ask that question. Now, where did he send them? He sent them to Jesus. When you have questions about the validity of Christ and his identity and the message of the gospel... Go to the source. Get your eyes on Jesus. There's a, there's a sports principle here. There's a driving principle here that we all know about instinctively, even if we don't know it <laughs> literally. The instinctive reality is you always look to where you want to go. If you're, if you're making a jump shot, you don't look into the stands. You look at the basket. If you're throwing a baseball and you intend to get the runner out at second base, and you're the catcher, you don't look to first base when you throw the ball. You look exactly where you want that ball to go. And when you are trying to discern the reality and the trustworthiness and the authenticity of the message of Christ, go to Christ. Go to the Gospels. Open the Scriptures. As Jesus said, these are what testify of me. So look exactly where you want to go. Second thing you need to know is that doubts will take you either toward Jesus or away from Jesus, and you always have to make the choice about where you're going. I can't emphasize this enough, young people. I can't emphasize this enough. When the doubts come, you will decide where you're going with your questions. Will you come back to the scriptures? Will you come back to the Lord Jesus? Or will you listen to someone who doesn't know Christ and never did, but sounds as if they know something? The next thing is that the answers that you get from Jesus, and this is very interesting, and we saw it in the text as we read it, 
the answers that we get from Jesus may not be what we expect. Did you notice that? Jesus didn't give John's disciples what we would call a straightforward answer. He gave them a more significant answer. We'll look at that in a minute. The answers you get from Jesus may not be what you expect, but they will always satisfy the deepest questions in your heart. That's so significant. And the other thing I I must say about this is that when you come to the Bible, the Bible will never fall short in the face of honest inquiry and never disappoints the honest inquirer. There have been so many people who have set out on the quest to disprove this book. And some of them couldn't resist writing books about their experience. (laughs) Josh McDowell being one. He was a complete disbeliever, agnostic. And as he explored the scriptures, instead of proving his theories, he came to realize that the Bible was true and that Jesus was indeed the Son of God, the Savior of the world. And he wrote evidence that demands a verdict. And then he wrote a second volume of more evidence that demands a verdict. Lee Strobel is a more recent example of this phenomenon. By the way, We have at the Welcome Center another book by Mark Middleberg entitled, what is the title of that book? Why Believing is Reasonable, or something like that. It's a great apologetic about the defensibility of the gospel, and it's written in a little more um, layman-like terms. So if you couldn't make it through The Case for Christ with Lee Strobel, which is a great book, and we have those available too, This other book is available for your donation up to the cost or whatever. If you need it, it's available to you. You can check that out at the Welcome Center. The Bible will never never fall short in the face of honest inquiry. You come to the scriptures asking honest questions, looking for honest answers. They are there. And you will come away with your faith greatly encouraged. If you're trying to test the reliability of the Bible, don't listen to somebody who doesn't believe it. So what's the the circumstance? These two disciples show up. What's the circumstance? Well, Jesus is right in the middle of his ministry. He's, He's teaching out of the context of his life, and he's healing people right there. They're seeing all this unfold. And then he finally gets to the answer. And here's his answer Essentially, this isn't what the text says, but when you think about it, this is what he's saying. Jesus took John, in his answer, back to what he knew the Old Testament predicted about the Messiah. To confirm what he was unsure about of Jesus. So that was his method. Jesus answered his question by Scripture. Now, he doesn't list the text, but let me read to you some of these messianic predictions from the Old Testament that John would have been very familiar with, and they would have reflected what these disciples had just seen. Okay? Isaiah 29, 18. And this is is Carol's uh, flag verse for her ministry. Isaiah 29, 18. In that day the deaf shall hear the words of the book, and out of their gloom and darkness the eyes of the blind shall see. Isaiah 35, 5, in the first part of verse 6. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. Isaiah 61. One through three, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. As Jesus reminds these 
followers of John to take what they'd seen and heard back to John, those passages in John's mind are going to be exploding like fireworks. So what's in his mind? Let's see. The scriptures promise that Messiah will give sight to the blind, that he'll heal the lame, that he'll cleanse the lepers, he'll give hearing to the deaf, literally raise the dead, preach wonderful news to the poor. That's what Jesus is doing. My mission has been a complete success. Since though I'm wasting away here in this miserable dungeon, Jesus is doing exactly what the scripture promised the Messiah would do. You can almost hear a sigh of relief coming out of that prison when John gets the message from his disciples. Then Jesus finishes this instruction to the followers of John with this little promise tagged on here at the end. By the way, this is the first half of what is a two-part message because we're going to come back here to Luke chapter 7 next week. Here's the promise. There's a wonderful blessing for everyone who's not offended by Jesus, who's not put off by Jesus. You know, the world and our culture is greatly offended by Jesus. You picked that up? It's weird how this has happened. In my lifetime, a culture that gave lip service to honoring Jesus has come to the place of being offended by Jesus. You can say anything, just don't mention Jesus. The verb offense here that Jesus uses is a colorful word. It comes from the trapping of birds. And um, it refers to the action that depresses the bait stick and so triggers the trap. That's the word that Jesus uses, blessed is he who is not offended by me. So this is a very memorable way to refer to someone who causes trouble or hurt. You see Jesus as troubling and hurtful. Is he causing trouble for you? Do his claims offend you? Do his commands put you off? Is he a stumbling stone? Does he dissatisfy you in some way? I hope not. Jesus said, if not, then you're blessed. You're happy. You've found the secret of living. As you come to Jesus, if you're coming to confirm your convictions, these are, these are wonderful words. No, I'm not offended by Jesus. I find him to be the most exciting, dynamic, creative person I've ever met. No, he does not offend me. I don't always understand him. I wish I knew him more deeply, but I'm longing to do that. I'm not offended. Now, if you're wavering in your convictions, then these are words of warning. Blessed is he who is not offended by me. Take that as a warning if you're wavering. When Jesus asked Peter and the disciples if they were going to leave as others had, who had been greatly offended by things that Jesus said, Peter gave this answer. Well, Lord, no, we're not leaving. Where, where else could we go? You're the only one who has the words of eternal life. There are all kinds of ideologies floating around, and uh, all of them bear a certain attraction to people, but probably the most dangerous allurement in our culture is rooted in our way of life, in our sense of personal freedom, and in our sense of personal destiny. And as Americans, we love the fact that we have these rights. But there's a spiritual danger connected to them because the Lord Jesus is inviting and in essence demanding to be your Lord. He's asking you to bow your knees and submit to his authority. And 
as a culture, we are so tempted to say, <laughs> wait, wait a minute, this, this, is, <clears throat> this is my life. <laughs> I'd like to call the shots, if you don't mind. If I need you, I'll let you know. That's not the deal. That's not the deal. The deal is that Jesus says, bow your knee because I am the Lord. You cannot receive Jesus as Savior and ignore the fact that he is Lord because he is Lord and Savior. And you cannot come and get half the deal. It's the whole deal or no deal. The appeal of the gospel is acknowledge Christ as Lord and that he rose from the dead. And when you acknowledge Christ as Lord and believe that God raised him from the dead, you will be transformed as Margaret was. You will experience salvation until you acknowledge that Christ is Lord you're in some kind, you've had some kind of spiritual inoculation and it won't get you to heaven. Now, John got this issue settled because he went right back to Jesus. If you've not got this settled, go back to Jesus, get on your knees and say, Jesus, you are the Lord of my life. Where you send me, I will go. What you ask of me, I will do. I don't know what that means, but you're the Lord, and I'm not. It's going to affect the decisions that you make, even on a casual basis. It will change the way you spend your money. It will affect the way you spend your time. It will impact the personal relationships that you chase. And it will affect your destiny. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this wonderful example from the man Jesus said was the greatest person who ever lived, John the Baptist. Thank you that even in his doubts, he showed us to go back to Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you stand with us? Take my life and let it be
Everlasting God. Now there's a part in here where we've been we've been playing with some stuff and it sounded really good and I'm just gonna lift some praise to God. There's gonna be a spot in the second part where the vocalists up here are gonna step back, but you guys get to carry it, okay? Um, but just keep singing. We're gonna sing on the second time through. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We wait upon the Lord, and there's four claps in there, okay? And then our God, you reign forever. The second time, we as vocalists are gonna drop back, but you guys get to lift the praises, okay? Here we go, strength will rise. Thing, uh, um, we did one for, for you Sunday a few weeks ago. It's called Happy Day. Here we go. The greatest day in history.
Amen. Yeah. Well, I didn't want to stop. That was terrific. <laughs> now, right after the service, uh, we're going to have a reception for Carol back in the library. So uh, please come. I know she'll want to greet as many of you as she can before she leaves on Tuesday. Uh, next week, we're going to get an update on uh, Deborah Brown's trip to Italy and some very important details. You don't want to miss that. We'll, we'll deal with that next week. She's just 10 days away from leaving on that trip. So still a few more dollars to raise. Thank you for helping with that. And uh, so stop in at the reception before you go on to Sunday school. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you. You know, we're praying that God will look at you this week. He is, of course, but I want you to be aware of it. And may he give you peace. God bless you. You're dismissed. Mm -hmm.